I'd like to thank you to everybody, particularly my fellow panelists, for being here for the first session of this second day. Journalists are not traditionally early morning people, so um, I think I owe a particular um, vote of thanks to uh, my colleagues for uh, uh, showing up even earlier than I did. Um, um, and I think we are we are blessed with a um, uh, particularly appropriate uh, panel. Chris Waddell, uh, professor at Carleton University, Heather Schofield, an economics columnist at the Toronto Star, Alec Castonguay, who is politics bureau chief at La Civilité, and Melissa Ridgen, journalist, host, and producer at APTN uh, uh, National News. We're having this meeting at in a period of unprecedented pressures on the national media. Uh, newspapers are in serious trouble and the advent of 24-hour news has channeled an endless hunger for easily digestible sound bites and pressures on reporters to respond instantly to every shift and change. Alec vient de me dire que hier, au huis clos, pour le budget à Québec, tous les journalistes mangeaient ensemble en parlant de, des difficultés des boîtes uh, différentes. Uh, mm. uh, le problème est uh, uh, universel et uh, on partage uh, nos peines, nos difficultés uh, uh, et, et nos défis. Journalists have less time to travel, less time to reflect, less money to travel, and more competition. At the same time, we are seeing growing regional and intergovernmental tensions over pipelines, carbon taxes, and SNC-Lavelin. In a study of public opinion um, that Andrew Parkin will be presenting later on to, uh, today, um, it was found that in a massive study that's on the front page of the Globe and Mail this morning, 50% of those polled in Alberta and Saskatchewan uh, feel that Western Canada gets so few benefits from being part of Canada that they might as well get on with it on their own. So for those of us who spent a large part of our lives wrestling with the, uh, uh, the issue of Quebec independence and, and all of a sudden that the, the line of tension has, has shifted. Uh, Chris Waddell, you've been Ottawa Bureau Chief, National Editor for the Globe and Mail, and a Senior Editor at the National before moving to the Academy. How can the media respond better to the regional tensions in the country with fewer resources? Uh, Graham, let me try to answer that in a couple of different ways. The simple and short answer, when Graham asked me this when we were talking about the panel, is to get out of your office and actually go and talk to people. Um, I thought for quite a while that political journalism spends too much time talking to the politicians and the bureaucrats and, the, and not enough time talking to the people who are affected by the decisions that politicians make and the legislation that governments introduce. And that's equally true whether it's at the federal level or the provincial level. Um, so you can't cover how people's lives are affected by policy changes or by by um, decisions made by governments if you sit in an office. You have to do what reporters traditionally do, which is go out, talk to people, um, see things for yourself, uh, talk to more people, um, make some judgments, and that's just as true today as it's always been. But I think um, I'd add as a little bit of a parenthesis on that, I think there's also far too much opinion and not enough facts in news these days. Um, but, but I think, uh, and it is more difficult in the current time to get out there for financial pressures and the other pressures that Graham talked about, some of which I'm not sure are particularly productive in terms of asking reporters to be filing the social media and doing this and everything else. At least if it is productive, it takes away from the work you're doing to try to produce a story. Um, but I think there's a more fundamental problem, and that's that, that basically what we've seen in, in, in political journalism and political journalism in Ottawa for the last 25 years is basically a reduction of 
who's there and who's doing the coverage. If you go back to the mid early 1990s, after the recession of 1990 to 92, 93, a lot of news organizations that were um, single interest, news, single interest, London Free Press, Windsor Star, Hamilton Spectator, BCTV, CFTO in Toronto, CJOH in Ottawa, they all had reporters in the Parliamentary Bureau. They all left. Those bureaus shut down. We then moved to the next phase, which was called Convergence, which was a disastrous attempt to merge newspapers and television stations, which ended up with the bankrupt of Sea of Can West Global and, and, uh, and Post Media. During that era, what we saw was the elimination of all the journalists who worked for um, larger news organizations across the country. When I was with Graham in the Ottawa Bureau in the late 80s, or at CBC as Bureau Chief on Parliament Hill in the 90s, in the early 90s, the, the Montreal Gazette had a columnist and two reporters in Ottawa. It now has nobody. Um, that's also true for the Saskatoon Star Phoenix, Calgary Herald, Edmonton Journal, uh, Vancouver Sun, all those papers. So what we're left with in, in, national, in political reporting federally is national news organizations whether it's in television, whether it's in, uh, or whether it's in print. And I would class the Toronto Star as national simply because of, it's now national because it also does stuff in Edmonton, Vancouver, Calgary, Halifax, but <clears throat> just the number of people that it reaches. Um, and what we've lost is uh, those people from the Hamilton Spectator or the London Free Press, they didn't really care much about the big issues of the day. They cared about what was happening in their community. And they were important on two levels. They actually told people in their communities what their local MPs were doing. They covered their local MPs. And equally important on the other side, they talked to their editors every day and their editors would say, we don't care about this that you're talking about, we care about what's happening here in Hamilton. And for instance, to give you a contemporary example, um, sitting in Montreal, we probably don't know an awful lot about canola. Canola is a big issue at the moment uh, and, and it revolves around China's refusal to accept Canadian canola and there's lots of Canadian canola now sitting waiting for China to change its mind which is all tied up with Huawei and everything else. There's nobody in Ottawa who every day is coming out to scrums and, and interjecting, so what's happening with that canola into those political, those discussions that go between media and, and, and politicians. You've got national news organizations. National news organizations don't care about local stories. And that's not a pejorative comment. They want to write stories or cover stories in broadcast that are equally relevant in Nova Scotia as they are in, in BC. So we've now reduced ourselves to a situation where um, where um, when we eliminate all that, we're no longer putting those issues into the debate that goes on every day between politicians and the media and doesn't get into the broader context. We're left with um, the PAC in Ottawa, and it's a much reduced PAC because many of those other entities don't exist there. Um, deciding what it selects to cover is, is what they think, it's imp they think is important to audiences across the country. Um, reinforced by what reporters read on Twitter and, and the compounding problem being people's apparent inability to understand that Twitter is not a reflection of public opinion. Uh, so what you end up with is single issue coverage. So right now we're doing SNC-Lavalin for a while and maybe we'll do something else for another while. Um, as a last point, I think what we've seen in political coverage in the last month or so is a worrisome prelude to the potential narrowness of what federal election coverage is going to be in the fall. Um, that's probably an answer to a different question, but, uh, but while we're all spending all our time wringing our hands about um, uh, misinformation or fake news or everything else, the real issue may just be that we don't have the diversity of news and don't have the diversity of, of because we've lost that diversity that came with different news organizations representing different interests in Ottawa. Heather Schofield, you've been a reporter for the Globe and Mail, Ottawa bureau chief for Canadian Press, and you've just recently joined the Toronto Star as a columnist. Um, Canadian Press is one of the few news organizations that serves the entire country, and in both languages. How have you been able to manage those tensions in light of the situation that Chris described, of the, the absence of local news in the way that used to exist? So I think, I mean, there's certainly a Canadian press, um, and I will speak mainly about Canadian press because I, I've only spent a week at the Toronto Star so far. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have a depth of knowledge there, but um, the uh, Canadian press, uh, you know, we are dealing with um, uh, 
with fewer resources than, than what we once had. So of course there's always that struggle. But I think it's important to look at the the structure of that company. It's very much set up um, to make sure that all the regions are taken into account. So there are correspondents in every province, except for Prince Edward Island, in which case it's covered out of Nova Scotia, and the north, we're also missing the north. Um, and uh, there is a, a, a fairly large bureau in Ottawa, a fairly big uh, business desk in, in Toronto, and um, there is a, the, a French service as well. So in, in, within that French service, not only do La Presse Canadienne covers Quebec, but there's also a very large um, translation effort that goes on to make sure that, that we're not having two separate conversations. So does that work? I mean, it, it, sounds, it sounds lovely, but um, it, 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 it works to a certain extent, I would say. There's an awful lot of time and effort put into coordinating and making sure all the bureaus are talking to each other and making sure that, you know, that, that anything of relevance in, in one province that would have national implications or part of a national conversation is, is sent out across the country. Um, and so we do try very much to, to to take into account all the different regional um, variations of whatever is happening. So just to give one example, um, when, uh, when the federal government bought the, bought the pipeline um, f from Kinder Morgan, uh, they, and that, that story started in, in Ottawa because we broke that story. In, in the Ottawa Bureau and developed it up overnight. In the morning, um, we, uh, Alberta was immediately out there chasing down Rachel Notley, chasing down um, on the business side of things, talking about all the, 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 getting the business implications of that happening also in Toronto. And so there was a, um, a lot of effort putting in, put into um, developing that across the country. In Quebec, where pipelines are also a very live issue, that it was covered in, in French, not just translated, but covered in French by, by, by the um, reporters at the Presse Canadienne. So it ended up being um, a, 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 a great package with a lot of regional variety in, in it. Where we fall down is when we move beyond spot news um, and as I think you mentioned earlier, really, the time for thought and reflection and pulling in different strands um, because there's not an awful lot of time for when, you're, when you have fewer resources and when you can't travel, um, there's not an awful lot of time to be just going out there and pulling in different opinions and letting it all sink in and being reflective. Um, and it also doesn't really fit into our model of hard news right now. So I do get somewhat concerned about that. Um, and I think there is, it's not a hopeless case though, because what I look at, um, I think there's a kind of a rationalization happening right now across the media landscape where um, there's, a, there's a very large dependence of, of pretty much every media organization depend on, on the National Wire Service, on Canadian Press, for all of those spot news developments. And as long as Canadian, pre Canadian Press can keep up a certain standard, of, of coverage and be completely reliable, the other media are, are saying, okay, we will leave that to them and we will engage as much as we possibly can in that extra thought and reflection. And so when you say, um, Chris, that there's too much uh, opinion, um, I think that is one way of, of different media organizations from differentiating each other, differ differentiating themselves from each other, where you add, you have your basic news um, and you push that as much as you can with your raft of reporters, but then you add on um, a columnist or two to do that extra thought and reflection and to take it in a, in a different way and to make sure that there is diversity even when we're, we're all being extremely squeezed for resources. So I wouldn't say it's a hopeless case, but it is a difficult case because, because uh, it, we're not. We're, we are certainly not traveling, and we're, we're all pressed for time, and everybody is pulled in, in a million different directions. Um, I would say there's a couple other hopeful signs as well. Both the Toronto Star and and the Globe and Mail have been, um, actually investing in new positions lately. Um, whether or not they can afford to, I have no idea, but they're doing it. Um, and you know, so so the Star has. Um, my position is a new one. Um, they are, they are, um, they've started up uh, or, or reconfigured some regional newspapers and put some hardcore investigative reporters in those bureaus. The Globe and Mail has just sent somebody up to Thunder Bay, Ontario, for, for a few months um, to, to cover that whole region, which is completely undercovered. Um, they've, they've invested in Halifax and so forth. So I think. Uh, there's a realization that, that there's a responsibility there and that uh, hopefully there's also a business case there for, for, us, for us to do 
above and beyond the, the very basics. Alec Castonguay, vous étiez un des premiers journalistes euh, à signaler la vertu d'un accord hors cours euh, avec SNC-Lavelin, un point de vue qui a vite fait consensus euh, au Québec. Comment expliquez-vous l'écart euh, dramatique entre le consensus québécois et le consensus euh, très différent dans le reste du Canada? Est-ce que c'est simplement du Québec bashing <rire> ou est-ce qu'il y a d'autres enjeux? Euh, euh, il y a, un, je pense, un, un mélange de plusieurs choses dans cette histoire-là de snc lavalin qui est un peu une espèce de, de révélateur de, de nos deux solitudes sur un enjeu particulier. Euh, C'est vrai qu'au Québec, on n'a pas la même vision de cette euh, crise politique-là à Ottawa. Euh, ça ne veut pas dire qu'on est tous convaincus que snc lavalin sont tous des, des bons garçons qui ont bien agi. Là. Au contraire, c'est une entreprise qui a eu énormément de problèmes au début des années 2000 quand tu invites le fils de Mohamed Kadhafi faire euh, ce qu'on appelait un sex tour à Montréal, on ne peut pas dire que c'était des comportements euh, tout à fait <rire> appropriés. Euh, mais nous, on a une vision de SNC-Lavalin qui est un peu différente du reste du pays, qui, eux, regardent ça de loin, qui sont conscients qu'un bon, certain nombre d'emplois sont en jeu, mais qui n'ont pas la, 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 même, la même proximité avec, euh, avec SNC-Lavalin. Pour nous, il y, a un, il y a un symbole historique avec SNC-Lavalin. C'est le, le début des, de la construction des grands barrages d'Hydro-Québec. Euh, SNC-Lavalin est très présente dans notre paysage montréalais. C'est elle qui construit le pont Champlain, c'est elle qui construit le REM, euh, le CUSUM. Bon, on sait comment ils ont obtenu le contrat, mais c'est quand même eux qui l'ont <rire> construit. Euh, donc, euh, oui, on a, on, on a une, une proximité. On a, vu, on a eu la commission Charbonneau. Euh, on a vu aussi tous les changements à la direction de SNC-Lavalin, tous les, euh, les postes qui ont été supprimés, les gens qui ont été mis à la porte, les nouveaux qui sont arrivés, le ménage qui a été fait. Euh, donc, on, on suit, nous, la progression, euh, la transformation de SNC-Lavalin qui a maintenant... Euh, euh, 9 000 employés au Canada, mais qu'il y en a 55 000 dans le reste du, dans le reste du monde. Donc, c'est une entreprise qui a plus d'employés de, de, en Grande-Bretagne maintenant qu'il y, euh, qu y en a ici. Euh, je ne pense pas qu'au Canada anglais, on avait suivi toutes les étapes de SNC-Lavalin, hein, qu'on savait où on était rendu dans ce processus-là, qu'on est conscient du, nécessairement du poids que l'entreprise a au Québec. Euh, et donc, quand cette histoire-là est, est sortie... Euh, euh, on l'a couvert uniquement au Canada anglais de l'angle politique. Est-ce que oui ou non, euh, Justin Trudeau et son entourage ont bien fait de discuter fortement ou de mettre de la pression, dépendamment de l'angle où vous vous trouvez avec l'ancienne la, euh, procureure générale? Puis, alors qu'ici au Québec, on s'est demandé très rapidement, moi entre autres, mais Yves Boisvert a beaucoup écrit dans la presse oui. aussi là-dessus, nous on s'est demandé très rapidement, très rapidement, mais pourquoi, bon Dieu, elle ne voulait pas faire ce fa cette fameuse accord de réparation-là? Euh, alors que c'est un, un, un débat euh, tout à fait intéressant et légitime, mais qui, qui, qui est comme secondaire au Canada anglais depuis le début de cette histoire-là. Euh, on a, nous, fouillé euh, au Québec. Il y avait encore un excellent texte d'Hélène Busetti dans Le Devoir ce matin qui parlait d'une étude de l'OCDE qui montrait que 91 des cas de corruption internationale par des entreprises étaient réglées hors cours. Donc, des compétiteurs à SNC-Lavalin ont tous des, eu des accords de réparation. Euh, que Simmons, qui vient de remporter le contrat des trains de via rail contre Bombardier, a eu un accord de réparation en Allemagne de 1,6 milliard en 2008. Nous, on a, tout, on a tout couvert ça parce que ça a une importance sur le siège social de SNC-Lavalin, son, son nombre d'employés. Euh, donc, la crise politique, elle a un, un contexte économique très fort très forte, euh, très fort ici, qui est moins au, au Canada anglais. Euh, et oui, je pense qu'il y a aussi un volet du traitement médiatique qui fait que c'est encore une entreprise du Québec aux prises avec des problèmes de corruption qui est euh, mêlée à des histoires politiques avec un premier ministre du Québec qui est probablement tout cosy avec une entreprise du Québec. Je pense que ça fait partie de de la trame narrative de cette histoire-là. On peut bien faire semblant que ça n'existe pas, mais je pense que ça existe. Euh, J'étais en février pendant une semaine en Alberta pour un texte que je prépare pour euh, le magazine. Je vais la citer à un des discours de Jason Kenney. Et euh, Jason Kenney, évidemment, une de ses euh, cibles favorites, c'est le, le pipeline Trans Mountain que Justin Trudeau a acheté. En Alberta, ils sont convaincus que Justin Trudeau a acheté le pipeline pour le fermer. C'est quand même fascinant. Euh, alors qu'ici, on, on trouve qu'il a payé vraiment cher pour acheter ce pipeline-là. C'est vraiment comme deux visions complètement différentes du même, euh, du même dossier. Et donc, Jason Kenney faisait son attaque euh, sur Justin Trudeau, puis il a dit, il a pris une petite pause. 
pour faire son effet. Puis il a dit, peut-être que si le pipeline était construit par SNC-Lavalin, ça aurait été plus rapide. Euh, puis là, tout le monde a ri. Puis là, quand la, 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 la foule a, a, s'est calmée un petit peu, il a dit, on aurait pu aussi le faire construire par Bombardier. Ah, là, là, ça a été la meilleure joke qu'on, qu'ils n'ont jamais entendue. Parce que Bombardier a très mauvaise presse dans le reste du Canada. Donc, quand vous mettez SNC-Lavalin puis Bombardier dans la même joke, il y a quand même un lien avec le fait que ça se passe au Québec et qu'il y a donc une espèce de courant là, de, d'entreprises québécoises qui sont favorisées au détriment d'autres entreprises. Euh, ça fait partie, ça fait partie de le, 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 du, de, du traitement médiatique de cette histoire-là. Euh, je ne pense pas que ce soit du Québec bashing là, typique là, où, bon, euh, parce que le Québec est différent, on parle français, une société distincte, on, on s'en permet un peu plus. Je pense que c'est juste une façon complètement différente de voir cette histoire-là. Euh, couverte différemment par les médias du, euh, du Québec. Euh, Puis nous, on se retrouve avec, euh, avec euh, une incompréhension de, de comment politiquement euh, une ministre de la Justice euh, qui, euh, dans le fond, se fait dire le 4 septembre par ses procureurs que le dossier de SNC Laval est clos, qu'il n'y aura pas d'accord de réparation. Pendant ce temps-là, elle est aux îles Fidji jusqu'au 11 septembre avec 17 heures de décalage horaire. Elle revient au travail le 12 septembre, puis dans son témoignage, elle nous raconte que le 16 septembre, cette décision finale était prise. Puis nous, on se dit, comment en quatre jours, on peut avoir décidé du sort d'une entreprise aussi importante? Peut-être que ça méritait d'autres discussions au bureau du premier ministre. Puis au Canada anglais, on dit, bien, comment ça se fait qu'ils n'ont pas compris que non, c'était non, puis qu'il y avait juste à l'écouter? Puis nous, au Québec, on dit, bien, ça, c'est la politique. C'est, c'est, c'est « just doing politics ». Il y a des discussions normales qu'il doit y avoir. Fait que c'est vraiment une conception complètement différente de cette, de cette histoire-là, qui est assez, je trouve, révélatrice de la manière dont on a souvent des discussions au pays sur différents, sur différents sujets. Tout à fait, merci. Melissa Ridgen, you're a journalist, host, and producer of APTN National News. How does your mandate differ from that of other news organizations? Canada's first Indigenous Minister of Justice was first reassigned and then resigned from Cabinet, setting off a crisis for the federal government that is still going on, I think, as we speak. Uh, How is your coverage different? Uh, Well, I mean, our mandate is obviously different. We're covering stories about Indigenous people or issues that matter to Indigenous people from an Indigenous perspective. So how this whole scandal has uh, shaken down is is different through the eyes of APTN in that, um, you know, it's not about necessarily a government scandal. Uh, which we're all kind of used to at this point. But it was more, um, you know, the, at the center of this is Jody Wilson-Raybould, who I think a lot of people, a lot of Indigenous people thought, oh, this is, you know, first Indigenous uh, Attorney General of Canada, this is that. We're, we're kind of getting there, we're making it. Um, and there was a lot of pride in that. But at the same time, you've got another faction of an Indian country who look and go, You can't be, you, I mean, this is the enemy. You can't be part of the enemy. You can't get into government and fix it from within. You will just get sucked in by it and become one of them, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the, in terms of how it shook down in, in coverage, um, I remember one of the first stories was that, you know, after it was that she had been pressured to intervene with, in the, uh, the prosecution of SNC Lavalin. Uh, one of the next stories that came out of it were reports that was, this was, she's, she's not a good attorney general, she's difficult to work with, she doesn't understand things, and to the broader uh, market of, of media market of consumers reading that, they look and go, oh, okay, you, this, this might, there's something to this, maybe that's what part of this is all about, but in Indian country, it was like, mm-hmm, this is exactly what is said when you have an indigenous woman who comes in and doesn't act like the puppet you thought she would be when you brought her into that role. Somebody had said, um, you know, if you want your token Indian puppet, you should probably talk to your token Indian puppet and make sure that she wants to be your token Indian puppet before you expect her to be your token Indian puppet. And then when she doesn't, uh, here we are, right? Another thing that I thought was interesting in how it was covered differently by us, there was, uh, I remember a lot um, given to, so, you know, in the follow-ups to this, somebody spoke, so somebody from mainstream media spoke to Jody's father, Bill Wilson, and there was a lot of blowback to that saying, you know, how dare you go and talk to her dad? Like, how, how offensive is this that we're... We're phoning, we're phoning the former attorney general's dad to be like, what do you think of this? And how just uh, super offensive that is. 
And to us, that was kind of the immediate follow was, we need to talk to Bill Wilson about this. And I guess you need to know the background of that. Bill Wilson, of course, um, did battle with Pierre Elliott Trudeau in the 80s, right? So there's that, you know, uh, the Wilson family versus Trudeau 1.0, and then we've got the new Wilson versus Trudeau 2.0. So that was a very natural um, go to Bill and be like, what do you think of this? The other, the other part of that story, too, is that there's, uh, and I'm not sure that this has been widely reported or is even known, um, Bill wasn't a happy man when his daughter ran for a government that he has spent his entire life fighting against and doesn't believe in and has raised his daughter to not believe in. And then there she goes, I want to be a Liberal MP and wins and then is of course Attorney General and that was, um, there's, there was tension there. And to our audience, they care about this because it's, it's very much about your, uh, your, your family, how's the family doing and, and it's your people. Right? And so we approach the story much differently than mainstream media, which just looks at it and says, this is an attorney general, and this is the government, and, and here's what's happening, and here's this issue. It's far more grassroots for us in terms of you know, the family dynamics, and these both being, you know, it's, it's, a, big, it's a big family in Indian country, right? <laughs> it's, a, it, it's an important family. So yeah, there was, it was different, we, there was no, uh, it wasn't offensive to anybody to be like, let's go talk to Bill about this circus sideshow that's happening. It's like, of course we're gonna go talk to Bill about this. Hmm. And, and he did not disappoint, I mean, Bill had, I had him on for 10 minutes and, um, you know, if you, back in the days of when I was working in print, if you were just taking notes, you would not have been able to keep up with the quotation gold coming out of that guy's mouth. It was <laughs> incredible. Um, but yeah, there was no, I, I thought that was a, a key difference um, in that, how dare you talk to the dad? It's like, of course we're fucking talking to the dad. This is, uh, that's a, such a huge part of the story. Did, did you feel that the mainstream media pr misunderstood or uh, should have covered this as an indigenous issue differently than it did? Um, I don't like it when mainstream media tries to cover indigenous issues because they come at them from a non-indigenous perspective. And when they try to do good in covering the indigenous issues, it oftentimes comes across with, as an indigenous person, you look and kind of go, there they are trying to do good again and do indigenous things. Um, so no, I think it was, I think it was right I, that it was just covered as a, here's a woman who is the attorney general and here's how this is all shaken down and just do it like that because oftentimes when non-indigenous media try to do stories from an indigenous perspective, it's from a white middle class guilt perspective that you can smell a mile away as an indigenous person and it's not done justice. Chris, the, the um, federal government has increased its funding of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, whose online presence now competes with every other news organization. Um, does the uh, federal proposal that to provide compensation or funding for, for other outlets compensate a bit for that compensation? And how do you see that new legislation and the role that CBC is now taking up on many platforms uh, complicating the, the media environment? Uh, I, think it does, I think it does complicate it a lot, Graham. Um, actually, I, I wrote a piece for the conversation that's actually in the conversation this morning. If anyone knows that site, you can read what I think about it. But um, <laughs> to give you the brief answer, um, I, I'm... The government's support for the media, I don't understand what's the objective. And, and um, if you don't know what the objective is, I don't know how you judge whether it's a success or not. There's a lot of money being put, but it's being put for very narrow, it's basically put for newspapers, but, but, but not really to indicate to do what. And I don't really, I mean, if you wanted to, if you wanted to say it's to help them make a transformation to digital, um, then you can designate jobs and you want to do that and say here are the jobs that help you make the transformation to digital So we should fund that the problem government faces in that I think is that is that the forest products industry wouldn't be very happy about the government funding people to stop buying their products 
um, to be blunt, even though we know they're going to stop buying their products and, and it doesn't have a long-term future. Print, I mean, um, for because circulation is declining. We, we also don't know, um, uh, we're funding, new, uh, the decline of circulation in, and I'll get to the CBC in a second, the decline of circulation at news organizations has been going on for quite a while. Yet we know nothing about what happened to the people, some of whom have died, who, no, who used to read um, newspapers who no longer read them. Uh, where do they get their information? Uh, what do they, uh, are they happy with the new sources of information that have replaced newspapers? Are they unhappy? Are they, are they missing things that newspapers and mainstream media used to provide as they've shrunk that they, they would like someone to provide? We don't know any of those things. Um, um, and I think just putting out $600 million to subsidize people with no idea of what the objective is, or no stated in that decision of what the objective is, or, in, in, or in any way to determine whether you're meeting the objective, doesn't seem to me like good public policy. On, on, and on a second level, um, I don't think the subsidies offered for um, subscribers to print to online publications is particularly smart, both because it's bad public policy. Um, those sorts of uh, boutique tax credits don't work. They don't encourage people to do things they don't otherwise do. And the problem that news organizations face is it, it, it's not that people are not subscribing to digital media because they think it's $13 and they only want to spend 10 The problem is they think they can get it for nothing somewhere else. So subsidizing someone to get something a bit cheaper when people can't make a differentiation between what people are asking to pay for and, and, um, and nothing and free is, is a real problem. The third issue is the government does need to indicate what it wants the CBC to be and do. And it's consistently refused to do that because you're right. The, um, the CBC has expanded massively into lots of different areas. Um, they've uh, expanded in terms of employees and everything else. And I can understand, I mean, anybody would do that if you give them the opportunity, any organization that's competing. But they now, but, and the, um, the private, in, uh, private media companies particularly are aggrieved by the fact that the CBC is selling advertising on its, on its website, even though digital advertising isn't really worth that much anyway. It's not, not going that way. Most of that advertising is going to Facebook and Google because they can, um, um, it's cheaper, it's more effective for people who are doing the advertising and a bunch of other reasons. Uh, and so, uh, but we also don't know, is, does the presence of the CBC constrain people who might be uh, want to fund someone to start something new, but they're afraid of having to compete with the, pub with the public broadcaster? Don't know the answer. So um, I think the big issue on all this is that we seem to be going into something without really having any idea what we're doing or why we're doing it. Can I uh, with, with any sense, of, with any sense of, uh, of, of whether it will work or won't. Can I, can I disagree somewhat with sure. that? Sure. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> um, I, I think the government uh, set out in, in, this, in this situation to um, look at market failure and look at what the media was producing, not to go and rescue a business that was, that was dealing with, with, with collapsing, but dealing with, uh, I mean, they, they framed it from the get-go as, okay, media produce something that's very valuable to democracy and the market is failing, therefore the, there is a role for government in this. So instead so, of picking winners, they're picking losers. <laughs> wow. there, but there's, would, would you disagree that, there, that, that, that if there's a public good at stake, that, that there is a responsibility there for, for, for government to make sure at, somehow that that market does not completely collapse? The, 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 the problem is in execution. But I don't think that that goal was ever completely lost. I mean, there's so many problems in defining the goal publicly, um, and and you know, media have a great deal of trouble uh, writing about themselves and speaking for themselves uh, about about themselves. Um, and also, because there's so much animosity with the government, um, you have very few MPs that are willing to stick their neck out and say that this should happen. So there's not a huge public discourse around what the goals here are, actually are. Um, but I think if you scratch the surface a little bit, you'll see that there is a constituency of MPs who are concerned in their own local markets that, that they are no longer able to communicate with their, with their constituents. And this is a problem um, regardless of what party you come from or what part of the country you're in, people are having trouble communicating. They're finding new ways, but it's, nothing is really as, as efficient as mass media in terms of sending out a message or, or communicating um, back and forth. 
there have been, no doubt, lots of problems in execution. I mean, we're still dealing with, it was more than a year ago when the government put $50 million into its budget for, for local news. Um, and there's so many different ways it could do that with, uh, without actually getting involved in dictating content and whatever, but there's, we just don't, have, it's been a year and they still haven't actually done it. Um, it the, similarly, with the larger package of tax and, uh, tax and incentive measures, um, they still, you know, we're still muddling around trying to figure out who, who can, who's considered media and who isn't, and it's become very politicized. I would just say that there is some um, solid thought in, in that, though. Uh, yes, boutique credits have not been particularly successful, but it is helpful, um, I think, to have a legitimacy made of, of, of subscriptions as a business model of the future. It's not, it's, it's, this is something we have to do. You know, when I was little and I used to deliver the Hamilton Spectator, I'd go door to door to collect the money. And it was at least every other house that I went and collected the money from. And why don't we, why, that, that has been lost. There is a push, I think, from, from um, media outlets, not the CBC, but everyone else, to get people to, um, to, to buy subscriptions. Um, it helps to have a model out there, at least, to say, yes, this is, this is one of the ways of the future. It also helps to have... Um, um, corporate um, structure flexibility, so that part of that package is indeed that. Like, why not uh, let, why not let companies um, restructure so that they can cooperate and um, f financially become integrated with in, in with charities or nonprofits? You know, just give them a little bit more freedom to do that. Um, so, I wouldn't uh, dismiss the whole package as a, as a pile of garbage. I like, hey, wait, I didn't I like dismiss it as a pile of garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Alec, il y a des modèles différents, qui, des innovations au Québec qui sont un peu euh, différentes. Ben, je, trouve, je, trouve, je trouve ça intéressant de la discussion parce que je pense que et Chris et Heather ont raison. Euh, c'est-à-dire que je pense que le gouvernement fédéral a bien identifié quel était le problème, c'est-à-dire que l'information de qualité coûte de l'argent euh, et que donc en trouvant une manière de, de, de mettre de l'argent là où c'est le plus euh, productif pour créer la, la, de la qualité, c'est-à-dire donc dans la, la masse salariale de ceux qui produisent du contenu, euh, je pense que l'intention, elle est bonne, euh, parce que c'est vrai que c est, c est faire de l'information de qualité coûte cher. Euh, le problème, c'est que la solution, elle est... Euh, c'est comme mettre un, un, un petit plaster sur une, 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 une plaie béante, c'est-à-dire que d'abord, il n'y a, a pas suffisamment d'argent pour tout le monde qui en a besoin, alors c'est un programme qui va exploser. Euh, puis le problème à la source, c'est euh, pas le fait d'avoir 15 de rabais pour un... un un, un, euh, un abonnement numérique, parce que moi, je ne suis plus capable d'entendre les gouvernements parler du virage numérique. Là, ça fait longtemps que les médias ont fait le virage numérique. Là. On a toutes des plateformes web, on a toutes des, des magazines qui sont disponibles en ligne. Euh, le problème, c'est que, Chris a raison, c'est que les gens ont de disponible de l'information gratuitement à côté et qui n'ont pas nécessairement la con, euh, conscience de la, la valeur de cette information-là. On n'y arrivera pas tant qu'on ne mettra pas les grandes plateformes qui sont en train de vampiriser les médias à contribution. Il faut que Facebook, il faut que Google, puis il faut qu'Amazon, il faut qu'ils payent une partie de l'argent qu'ils font grâce à notre contenu. Puis ça prend, je vais le dire comme ça, mais ça prend un petit peu de colonne vertébrale oui. gouvernementale pour euh, trouver une manière de leur imposer. Et je profite du fait qu'on a un représentant de l'ancien gouvernement libéral québécois ici dans la salle. Jean-Marc Fournier est assis juste là. Parce que quand ils ont décidé d'imposer euh, la TVQ à Netflix, puis à Facebook, puis à Google, tout le monde disait « c'est compliqué, ça ne fonctionnera pas ». Puis Carlos Letao est allé de l'avant, puis il l'a mis. Puis vous savez quoi? Ils se sont tous inscrits à Revenu Québec pour faire payer la TPS, la, la TVQ. Ah non, regardons, ils ont le goût d'être des bons citoyens corporatifs quand on les force à le faire. Parce que si on ne les force pas à le faire, ils ne vont jamais le faire. Ils n'ont pas besoin de le faire. Le fonds des médias pour la télé fonctionne depuis très longtemps où les câbleaux distributeurs payent dans un fonds parce qu'ils sont le canal puis ils profitent du contenu des artistes au bout pour pouvoir faire de l'argent. Puis il y a 200 millions par année qui est redistribué pour que l'écosystème fonctionne. Je ne comprends pas pourquoi Facebook puis Google, qui piquent les, les nouvelles de l'actualité ou du Devoir ou du Globe and Mail, ne devraient pas payer un certain pourcentage sur le profit qu'ils font annuellement au Canada avec la transmission de notre information. Mais ça, il faut que tu dises à Google et Facebook qu'ils n'ont pas le choix de le faire. Puis que sinon, ben, tu pars en campagne contre eux. Puis publiquement, vous allez voir qu'il y a des chances qu'ils se rendent dans, qu rentrent dans le rang. Mais on est à face à un gouvernement libéral de Justin Trudeau qui n'est même pas capable d'imposer la TPS sur Netflix parce qu'il trouve que c'est une nouvelle taxe. Fait que, euh, on est loin, loin, loin d'avoir euh, suffisamment de colonnes vertébrales pour le faire. Mais là, ça, à la base, là, ça ne se réglera pas tant que ceux qui ne vont pas chercher 80 de nos revenus ne sont pas mis en contribution pour que l'écosystème fonctionne. Melissa, what are, what are the challenges for... Oh, sorry, Chris. I, I wanted to respond to Heather for just a second. <laughs> 
I, I mean, need to respond to you, to Heather, okay. and I'm not sure you because I'm a... Okay. <laughs> do you want to go first, Melissa? Then, then well, I get a chance to respond to you, too. Okay, so let's do it that way, then. Um, one thing I think in terms of this uh, you know, the money for, for media is, are we not all collectively embarrassed that we've come to the point where we need a government bailout? Like, aren't we better than that? It's almost like we've lost our... Our, our, we have no shame in that anymore, and that we're okay, I guess, with feeling we need this this money. But how did we get to this point where our work isn't valued like it once was? People aren't willing to pay for it. And I think that, you know, you, it's easy as journalists, we look and go, here's all the reasons why people don't pay for what we do. Uh, and there's what's missing in it, I think, is a lot of self-reflection about what our role in it is, is in how our work has been devalued. I think that um, long gone are those days where it's like you're a member of the media and that meant something and it was important. People have very little trust in what we do now. Uh, we live in an era of fake news and we like to point blame and say, it's not fake news, that this, this, these people have, are telling you it's fake news. And we have no self-reflection as to our role in why that is, and I, that's not a conversation I've heard still. We're always looking, going, how, how do we traverse through this? How do we um, keep going? How do we make money? How do we get the public to, to love us again, sort of thing? And we've never stopped and thought, why, how did we lose it? And we do have a role in that, we have. We've, um, you know, we, we've, for, just for one example, I mean, we're more, reporters are more interested now in likes and retweets on Twitter than we are about telling really good, solid stories. We've, we've kind of bought into our own bullshit in that we, uh, do you know who I am? Look at me, I've got 20,000 followers on Twitter and it's all about being, we make fun of these social media influencers. That's a large ch chunk of our job now. And I think that if we want to get back to a point where we, are valued for our work and people will pay us for that, we need to park that bullshit. Um, we need to get back to telling stories that matter as opposed to telling stories that get clicks and likes and retweets. Uh, I think we need to look at what we've become in terms of how we choose stories, frame stories, structure stories, who we choose to and not choose to talk to. We've become a part of, you know, in the, in the face of this fake news, instead of realizing what we've done to be part of that, we seem to just be worsening it. We've like doubled down on um, the things that have made people distrust us in our story structures, who we talk to, the angle we approach things from. I think we're, we're our own worst enemies and, and it's got to the point where now we're taking government handouts and it's embarrassing. Okay, I was going to disagree with Melissa, but I can't because I agree with most everything she says. <laughs> but but, I, but let me make a, a, let me clarify a couple of things I said so I can ride home on the train with Heather as well. Um, <laughs> it's not that people won't pay for news. Um, public opinion research in Canada says that nine percent of people are prepared to pay for news online, and that's been the consistent result of a series of surveys done over the last several years. Now, you know, what's the maximum on that? Maybe it's 20 or 25, because not everybody had a newspaper subscription in the good old days. People will pay for news that they, or pay for information that they think is important and helps them in their lives. And in fact, we're not, what's failing is the general interest newspaper or news organization that tries to provide a little bit of everything to everyone. And it's failing for a couple of reasons. Largely it was supported by advertising. It was never supported by audiences anyway. Only in newspapers case, only about 20% of the revenue came from, ad from uh, subscribers and readers. 80% came from advertising. As Alex has talked about, that's all disappeared now, or disappearing quickly. And what's going online is, is, is not really worth very much. But there are examples of where people will pay for information online. Business is one obvious one. People will pay for the Financial Times or the New York Times or, or the Globe and Mail because they think that um, the, they think that spending money, get, what they're getting helps them make money. They might be right, they might be wrong. Um, they're also in a circumstance where employers will pay for that to cover the cost, so it pays for that. But other things are working. I don't know how many people know of a publication called The Athletic which is a sports publication, which is very popular and is doing quite well, 
is a very narrowly focused uh, publication. What it does is it provides more, more coverage and more depth better than anybody else. And what they've managed to do is steal away most of the sports departments of newspapers in, 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 and, and uh, online and um, broadcasters in Canada. Um, there's other examples that people are trying to do. Uh, rather, I guess I, what I would argue is rather trying to keep the general interest publication that tries to appeal to everyone alive, we would be better to spend our time figuring how do we deal in an environment where we no longer have that and the role that that used to play as kind of the meeting place or the exchanging of ideas and what's the world, how do we deal in a world where we've got audiences each of whom are dealing with more specialized things and the things they're interested in. And that's where I think we're going. But the, prob the problem with that is, I would say, that there's, there's a huge social cohesion problem with that because if you don't have general generalized publications that a community is engaging in, then you have uh, you end up going down your your own personal rabbit hole. I do it every single morning, right? I inhale federal politics as much as I possibly can, but I have no idea what who my neighbors are, when the garbage pickup is, and that the arena might be closed. And and you know, like. But you can find that out online if you want. I, but it's <laughs> go not, to the municipal website. Right, but except except is that what we become? Like you just go and search. You 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 have to go online and search for one thing that you might know. What about things that I don't know that I want to know, you know, that, that, that bring you community together. You don't, you don't know. Well, this is the thing. If you have a newspaper <laughs> yeah. that's got a picture of a community or a picture of a country or enables regional understanding, which is, I believe, the question of the day, mm -hmm. um, then, then yeah. it's not, if you read The Athletic, you're not going to get, you're mm -hmm. not going to get a regional understanding. You're not going to understand why there are yellow vests in your backyard or, or why there's a convoy coming down or why it is that, 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 that people in Quebec think differently about SNC-Lavalin. You're so... There's, I think, a lot to be said for having a very general interest um, publication but there's no audience that, brings, for it. that brings us together. But there's no audience for it. People won't pay for it. So, but isn't, that takes us back to, I think, what, what, what Melissa was saying, that it's, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that there's an audience, but also, if the government wants to help with that and figure out a way, then maybe there's a case for that, too. Hmm. Aux États-Unis, on a vu une polarisation extrême euh, des, des médias où euh, euh, si on regarde Fox News ou si on regarde MSNBC, on, on a euh, une vision tout à fait contradictoire euh, de la situation aux États-Unis euh, et euh, mondiale. Euh, Est-ce que on se trouve sur le même chemin. Est-ce qu'il y a un danger d'une polarisation semblable euh, au Canada? Et sinon, pourquoi? Dans les médias, vous voulez dire? Oui. Ben, le chemin a été essayé, ça s'appelait Sun News, puis ça n'a pas fonctionné euh, au Canada. Est-ce que c'est parce que Sun News n'était pas aussi habile que Fox News pour être capable d'attirer l'attention d'un certain public plus conservateur. Il y avait peut-être une question d'exécution de, et de talent là-dedans, là, parce que ça ressemblait parfois à une chaîne un peu étudiante là, en termes ouais. de qualité. Euh, mais il y a aussi peut-être le fait qu'on est d'abord pas très nombreux au Canada. On est quoi, 38 millions, quelque chose comme ça. Donc, le, le, le segment de la population euh, conservatrice qui va s'intéresser uniquement aux nouvelles conservatrices c'est peut-être pas très euh, important. Aux États-Unis, ils sont 320 millions. Ça permet une spécialisation un peu plus importante, puis d'aller chercher des revenus puis des, des, des téléspectateurs en conséquence. Au Canada, c'est un c'est un petit peu moins le cas. Euh, on a historiquement au Canada aussi euh, un peu moins de polarisation dans nos débats politiques. On, entre les conservateurs fédéraux et les libéraux fédéraux, il y a des désaccords, mais grosso modo, ça reste deux parties, un de centre-droit, un de centre-gauche. Puis c'est pas pour rien que tout le monde fait des blagues sur le fait que les Canadiens passent leur temps à s'excuser, puis qu'ils sont polis. Puis je veux dire, il y a un, un peu un fondement à ça. C'est-à-dire qu'on est pas mal centriste en général, même s'il y a effectivement des, 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 des positions un peu plus extrêmes. Euh, donc, je, on est dans une ère où on, la polarisation, on la sent de plus en plus. On, euh, Maxime Bernier a parti son parti à droite, puis lui, il pense qu'il y a un électorat là. Puis, euh, puis Doug Ford est premier ministre de Puis Doug Ford, il y, un, il y a un populisme qui fait qu'on est plus polarisé, parce qu'Eder le disait, on, on est de plus en plus dans des, dans des silos. Euh, on s'informe par rapport à ce que nos amis nous amènent sur Twitter puis sur Facebook. Puis nous, par définition, nos amis, nos parents sont dans une même tranche sociodémographique que nous, pensent un peu pareil comme nous. Donc, on reçoit d'informations qui est... Euh, 
euh, déjà teinté idéologiquement. Tu n'as pas accès nécessairement le point de vue de l'autre qui n'est pas nécessairement d'accord avec toi. Moi, c'est quelque chose qui m'inquiète beaucoup euh, dans la société actuelle, de ne pas être confronté au point de vue de l'autre. Quand tu avais des, des grands médias en santé, comme Heather faisait référence, ben, tu n'avais pas le choix de voir ce que euh, les conservateurs pensaient puisque les libéraux pensaient. Tout était au même endroit. Maintenant, c'est tout des, des petits silos. Il faut que tu fasses l'effort pour aller chercher ce que l'autre pense. Euh, ça, ça atteint beaucoup le, le débat politique actuellement. Euh, Puis ça, euh, ça complique les lieux de rassemblement. Au Québec, on est encore chanceux d'avoir quelques grands rendez-vous. Je pense à tout le monde en parle le oui. dimanche où on a encore plus d'un million de personnes qui ont donc euh, différents points de vue. Puis même là, vous parlez à des, des personnes un peu plus à droite, puis bon, détester tout le monde en parle en disant que c'est juste des points de vue de gauche. Mais il y a quand même au moins plus d'un million de personnes qui se rassemblent de, de, devant la télé au même moment. C est, c est, c est, pour parler d'affaires publiques, c'est exceptionnel quand même. Euh, donc, je ne sais pas si on va voir cette spécialisation-là ici, euh, mais elle existe déjà par les, les, les réseaux sociaux. C'est juste que les grands médias, il euh, n'y en a pas eu qui se sont nichés là, particulièrement. Mais moi, je me souviens d'un exemple très concret lors du conflit étudiant de 2012, où j'ai un de mes meilleurs amis euh, qui, était, qui, qui, depuis très longtemps, on, on se connaît, on a fait le cégep ensemble, puis il m'était arrivé au milieu de l'été 2012 en me disant qu'il ne comprenait pas pourquoi le gouvernement libéral ne revenait pas sur sa décision d'augmenter les frais de scolarité, puisque 95 des Québécois étaient contre, tu puis là, je dis, non, 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 t'es complètement dans le champ. Là. Les derniers sondages montrent que 62 des Québécois sont d'accord avec la décision de Jean Charest. Puis ils disaient, c'est impossible, c'est impossible. T'sais. Puis il a commencé à regarder, puis il s'est rendu compte qu'effectivement, il y avait un, une Twitter list, puis il y a des Facebook qui étaient très, très du côté des étudiants, parce que lui, c était, c était un, il vit sur le plateau, puis il est plutôt à gauche. Puis non, mais c est, c est, il est gay, puis dans la communauté gay, euh, disons que c'était pas mal unanime. Puis. Puis qu'est-ce qu'il a fait après le conflit étudiant? Ben il a fait du ménage dans sa Twitter list, puis il s'est abonné à des gens de, de ouais, mais d'autres de, de, orientations politiques. Puis il me dit plus tard, il dit, ça a comme été un wake-up call, tu sais, que je me suis... Mais combien de personnes vont faire le wake-up call comme ça, puis vont juste penser qu'en fait, c'était la bonne vision qu'il y avait auparavant? Moi, c'est quelque chose qui m'inquiète un peu pour le débat public. Ouais. Là, ouais. Chris, what do you think? Is, are we moving to uh, that kind of Fox, MSNBC polarization? And to what extent... With the election of, of Doug Ford uh, and the presence of, of Sun Papers and uh, National Post, are we seeing that kind of niche polarization ideologically? I guess I'd start by saying I think it's hard to overestimate the damage Rupert Murdoch has done to democracy in the United States and Great Britain. Um, I think it's a serious issue, and, and, uh, and I think a significant amount of what we're seeing, the chaos in the UK today, can be traced back to Murdoch papers and, and the way they've distorted and lied about things, and Fox does that as well. Having said that, I think we're, uh, we're uh, a different country in a different political climate, and I would point to two or three things. The United States has had now almost 50 years of both vilifying media, which goes back to Spiro Agnew, for those of you old enough to remember him, uh, who was vice president of, uh, Richard Nixon's vice president, who had to resign for, I forget what the reason was now, some sort of, uh, some sort Accepting of. money in brown envelopes, as I recall, <laughs> when he was governor of Maryland. I'm not gonna say anything about that as it relates to prime ministers of Canada, but, <laughs> but, but, um, but, um, so they've had 50 years of, of vilifying the media and making media the villain and, and polarizing society. Uh, American politics, despite Doug Ford and everyone else, is much more polarized than Canadian politics. Uh, and we don't, I don't think there's, uh, I, you know, Doug Ford won, but you could have run almost anybody and they were going to win in Ontario. It was clear that for whatever reason, the public didn't want, the Liberals had been there for a long time, they didn't want them there for anymore. Um, we'll see if they get re-elected. We'll see what happens in the federal election and the degree to which the Liberals, federal Liberals run against Doug Ford in Ontario. There's a few interesting things in the budget that relate to that. Um, Mr. Ford r removed the six month provision that students had where they wouldn't have to pay interest on their loans before they had to start paying them back. Uh, Ms. Uh, the federal government instituted that for Canada student loans as opposed to the Ontario student loan program. There's, uh, there's also the, um, the um, electric vehicle stuff that the Ontario government got rid of and more conservation things that the Ontario government have gotten rid of in terms of energy conservation that the federal government's introducing. The federal government's also, I think, playing an interesting, um, trying to revive something that you need to be really old to remember, which was the early attempts in the 1970s to produce a Ministry of Municipal Affairs or, um, or, or going over the provinces. They seem to be doing that in some of the budget as well. But I, think, uh, I don't think we have the political polarization they have in the United States, despite attempts of people to do that. Um, as uh, Alex said, 
um, Sun TV was a failure. It was a network in a room, and it, and it was mostly run, I think, as an attempt to try to game the system by getting on. Um, if you could get on, uh, if you could get on, at that point was basic coverage, everybody had to subscribe to you, and then you didn't care if anybody watched you or not. You were getting the revenue. So Mr. Pelado went through several versions of that, and, and, and the CRTC helped him a little bit. But in the end, like 4,000, 5,000 people were watching it, which is not a large television audience, although it may be big if you're looking for likes on Twitter. Um, um, but the third thing that's important is there's a public broadcaster in Canada. And the public broadcaster in Canada, despite um, our earlier comments, plays a significant role both in terms of being a different voice, um, being a voice that maintains the high journalistic standards, and also is such that the private broadcasters in Canada realize the public broadcaster is there and feel that they need, they, 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 they exert a, a, what's the word I want? Um, the other broadcasters feel that they have to live up to the same standard as the CBC does. And I should disclose my I was a CBC employee for 10 years, but, um, <laughs> but still, um, having a significant public broadcaster it, it does make a difference in terms of, um, um, in terms of the media environment too. So I, I don't think that's going to happen, but I might be wrong. Melissa? I think that um, the public broadcaster, and, and it's met, we, we all pay for this public broadcaster, I think it's got the most important job in that it should be reflective of uh, a, a, the vast majority, right? And I think that CBC is failing in that they are very good at pandering to a, a progressive, very liberal type of person. And then they feed us news to, to those, that appeals to those people, but they make it seem like this is important to all of us. And Canadians sniff that and go, that's not for me. And we're paying for this, and there's a lot of people who have a very valid distrust in the news that they're getting from the public broadcaster. The stories that they choose to cover, how they cover them, who they choose to talk to, the quotes that they use from these people, how they structure their story. Um, you read it, as a journalist, I read it going, I see who you're talking to, and I see what you're trying to say. You are, the, the, the power that you're trying to influence through this story and then I look and, and think, you know, if this was a private company, you're entitled to do that. Uh, you know, you can come at it from a bent, and you can, you can, um, you know, you can be a right-leaning paper, you could be a left-leaning, uh, whatever. But the public broadcaster, as it's paid for by everybody, should be above that. And I find that not only are they not above it, they are the worst for pandering to a small chunk of. The people that they like to hang out with, the the, the people they in their social circle, circles, you know, little champagne socialists, the progressives, the cool, smart people. And What's wrong with downtown Toronto? <laughs> so you know, people, regular people outside of uh, you know rooms like this, outside of Toronto, outside of um, Ottawa. They look at, at CBC and they smell bullshit. And I'm going to keep saying the word bullshit as long as we're here because that's, it's off, too often um, very relevant when we're talking about the state of media. And I think CBC might be among the worst for the bullshit that's, that's uh, passed off as news now. And there's, and there's a lack of willingness to go, to, to see it for what it is and say, oh, hey, we are guilty of this. When you bring it up, that's the other thing. Journalists lack humility more than any other profession. There's no, there's no self-reflection and there's an arrogance that we hide behind. And when people bring up what we're doing wrong or if, there's, if they're critical of, of the product we're giving them, journalists, I think, are the, among the worst for accepting any criticism and being willing to fix it. We find reasons to discredit, dismiss, discount the people who, who see that we're not doing it right. <laughs> doc, doc. How dare there's you a, say there's that? A, there's a lot of doctors who sort of don't know <laughs> too, but. Heather, did you find uh, at Canadian Press, and uh, 
do you find now at the Toronto Star that 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 there is a uh, there are ideological pressures that that you've had to deal with as as a manager of, of, of a national news organization that was had the mandate to be able to serve papers of very different uh, uh, ideological stripe um, I think well Canadian press has made a I mean, their brand is to be as as straight as possible, mm -hmm. um, and I think everybody respects that. And um, I would say, just on the self-reflection thing, that's all we do at our news meetings every single day: is take our own selves down and completely tear our stories apart about how do we make them better, how do we make sure that we are reflecting every single point of view, and how do we make sure that we don't have any bias. It's top of mind all the time. Mm -hmm. So, to your earlier point of um, not looking at ourselves very closely, I would completely disagree. Um, I think we are trying very, very hard uh, to make sure that we're, we maintain the credibility because there's so much of a, in, in, in a time when, when there is so much, um, when there's so much fake news spreading on, on social media, uh, I think uh, it's incumbent on, on legacy media or me any media that has a solid reputation to maintain that and make sure it's as pristine as possible. Mm -hmm. So by taking sides or, or bending in a certain direction, there's, I think, a, a realization within news organizations that, no, you shouldn't do that. You've got to make sure that you hold on to this very precious thing called credibility and make sure that you enhance it as much as possible. So. Is you can hold them up as an example of doing it well. Through all of this, CP has and I remained would, above. I would say for, for the Toronto Star, um, they uh, obviously brand themselves as progressive. It's right on their, their tagline. Um, they have never, I mean, it's only been a week, but even in, in the hiring <laughs> in the hiring process or that whole that whole, they did not ask me what I. They, they didn't pressure me one way or another. There's never been a framework imposed upon me to 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 head off. And in I any like that they're direction. honest about where they come from too, right? So it's like we are progressive. We're coming at it from this pr this perspective. We're going to cover a whole bunch of things, but just know that we approach it from this angle. And if there was more honesty in media with uh, where we're approaching, if there if there is an approach, if there is an angle that you're coming from, if there was more honesty about it, and I find that there's oftentimes that gets oh, we're not coming from any angle. Uh, we're just coming straight up the middle. And you look at the body of work and you go, that's, that's not true. I can, I can circle with the red pen a whole bunch of things that make me suggest that you did come at it from an angle and you do have a bias. And I like, you know, the Toronto Star does, does good journalism and they're honest about where they're coming at it from. And if we could see more of that, you do have the trust. People don't necessarily expect you to be um, not coming from an angle, just be honest about where you're coming from. And then, and then you can check your, you can hold your body of work up against that and people should be able to see, yeah, yeah, but they still have credibility and, and I trust them that they did this fairly even though they approached it from this way. And we don't see enough of that, I feel. Il y a la manière dont, dont nous on, on, on traite les histoires qui est effectivement un point de vue. Euh, moi, je vis dans Rosemont, à Montréal, puis je fais partie d'un environnement en particulier. Puis je, chaque fois que je fais mes analyses politiques, j'essaie de, de, de me mettre à la place de quelqu'un qui vit à Blainville ou à Rimouski pour être certain d'avoir différents points de vue, mais il faut le faire consciemment. Il faut y penser à chaque fois. Euh, mais je pense aussi la manière dont les gens reçoivent l'information a changé. On parlait tout à l'heure de l'espèce de polarisation du débat public. Ils reçoivent avec... Euh, un manque de nuances qui était peut-être moins présent il y a quelques années. C'est-à-dire que euh, il y a deux ans à peu près, euh, au magazine L'Actualité, on, on a fait une première page avec, euh, avec Maxime Bernier. Tu sais. Puis euh, il était en course à la direction, puis on, un front cover, petit le bat de Trudeau. Puis je fais 12 pages sur un gars qui est libertarien puis qui croit à peu près pas au changement climatique. Là, oui, tu sais. oui, oui. Puis, euh, c'est un grand portrait de lui. Je l'ai suivi à Vancouver. Je me suis promené avec lui à travers le pays qu'il faisait. Puis c'était vraiment comme le portrait définitif de « Vous allez tous avoir sur Maxime Bernier ». Puis là, on s'est fait accuser d'être un, un magazine de droite, qui faisait la promotion des idées libertariennes. Puis Charles Grandmont, mon rédacteur en chef, répondait aux gens « Vous savez, on est un magazine grand public, le seul qui existe au Québec, donc on couvre toute une variété de, de politiciens ». Puis la même année, ça c'est sorti au, au début du mois de mai, la même année, au début du mois d'août, on fait un front cover avec Gabriel Nadeau-Dubois. Puis écoute, on a reçu des courriels là, disant qu'on était pro-Québec solidaire. Puis, que, puis là, je leur répondais individuellement avec un lien. Je dis, il y a trois mois, j'ai fait 14 pages sur un libertarien. Hein. 
Les gens, ça, les, ça, non, la seule chose qui comptait, c'est qu'on faisait la promotion de Gabriel Nadeau-Dubois. Puis les gens ont, 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 ont une mémoire de poisson rouge. Là. Je veux dire, à un moment donné, ils ne ils, ils suivent pas ton travail, ils prennent un tweet, tu, tu parles d'un texte, puis là, ils s'enflamment en disant que tu fais la promotion. Puis, alors que, me semble qu'avant, les, les, les citoyens aussi prenaient le temps de regarder sur une plus longue période, mais les gens ne sont plus nécessairement abonnés, ils vont prendre un texte, ils n'auront pas vu l'autre d'avant parce que ça ne les intéressait pas, donc oui. ils ne s'intéressaient pas à ce sujet-là. Donc, ça fait en sorte que hey, la bullshit dont, euh, <rire> dont parle Mélissa est aussi en partie liée au fait qu'ils ont une propre conception de ce que devrait être le monde, puis quand ça ne leur ressemble pas, ça les heurte. Oui. Alors qu'avant, on se disait, il faudrait que je comprenne ce que l'autre pense, maintenant, c'est... Pourquoi est-ce que vous faites la promotion d'une idée qui n'est pas la mienne? Puis ça, ça, ça arrive dans, dans un contexte médiatique qui est parfois euh, est agressif sur les réseaux sociaux. Ça arrive. <laughs> Graham, uh, uh, Graham, can I add one thing which I, I didn't add before, which I think is significant yeah. when we're on the whole discussion of, of Canada, U.S. And, and, and then, I'll, then I'll throw the floor open okay. to questions. The one thing I would say that adds a significant difference between Canada and the U.S. is um, uh, newspapers can take whatever positions they want, and it's probably a good idea if they do. Uh, it's a bit of a fiction that they don't have positions anyway, so it's probably better that they do, that they actually say what they support. Um, but on the broadcast level, in Canada, there are specific rules imposed by the CRTC as to what you can, as to what's, uh, what's partisan and what you have to do and, and, and to ensure that you're not Um, I can't think of the right word or the right terminology. The FCC in the U.S. used to have that. They got rid of that. And when they got rid of that, that allowed the, the foxes... The, and those the other fairness people. doctrine, yeah, I think is what essentially it's fairness doctrine, that's right. And when they got rid of that, that allowed the foxes and other people to come in and start to... Now, why they got rid of that, I'm not enough of a historian of the FCC to know. But, but that still exists in Canada, and that, can, that does have a, a, a significant impact on preventing the sort of thing that Fox has created in the United States. At least I'd argue that. Um, we have a, a few minutes left, and I think uh, it's, it's time for questions from the floor. And there is a there is a uh, there is a microphone. And please, please, please identify yourself uh, for the uh, the record. Hi, I'm Jennifer Ditchman, I'm the editor in chief of Policy Options. And listening to this with great interest, and I wanted to bring it back to federalism and federation. And I, I think Heather said the words that were going through my mind the whole time, which was social cohesion. And uh, I'll, I'll, I just will put this out there that for you to comment on, but I think there's two threats, big threats, that, uh, that intersect between the media and the Federation. Um, one is that we are rapidly losing the, the ability to reflect the country back to itself. And I think that the, 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 the um, challenges that the Canadian press is facing are, is a big policy issue that people just ignore. The fact that they just cut half of their Atlantic Bureau, uh, there's, there's no um, full-time person in St. John's, there's no full-time person in Charlottetown, there's nobody covering the North. And so are we going to arrive at a point where if you live in Red Deer, you will never read a story about someone in Quebec City? And I think, I wish someone would do a scholarly study on this because I think it's incredibly important. And the second thing I think is that um, there's a, a huge problem in the Canadian media landscape with diversity, and it's a still a very, very white landscape. And um, I think that has direct relevance on our relationship with Indigenous peoples and a, a complete lack of understanding in most newsrooms about treaty obligations, about the Constitution, and so on. So I just put those two things forward as two huge challenges that to the Federation that the, that the media poses right now. So if I can just respond to that a little bit. Um, I completely agree with you that those are two issues. And just to explain a little bit further, um, so there have been, yeah, so Canadian Press has just had a few, few rounds of cuts. And uh, part of the issue is, um, you know, if we look at cost centers, uh, if the regional media in Nova Scotia is in a crisis and therefore the support for CP Halifax is is very tenuous so um, the you know that the finances of that would be to okay it's not making any money let's cut it um, and just concentrate on where we are making money but they didn't do that they cut some of it and maintained a presence there as best they could the same thing happened with la presse canadienne if the the Quebec media is not 
it's not doing well, then that's going to be reflected back in and it's going to be augmented by the fact that that, that cost center is hurting. Um, so it was not eliminated, but it was cut. The video desk, the video had us, we had the same, with the same issue. Um, but there is an overriding responsibility, I think, within that company that they take to heart to make sure that at least some is still left. Um, and then compounding on top of that, the, the, the problem of diversity, it is very much an issue that's on everybody's minds and the, the, the problem when you're cutting, how do you solve that? I don't know the answer. Je, je peux répondre oui, rapidement. Oui. Commencer par dire que Jennifer Digiburn était une des meilleures journalistes de la colonne parlementaire à Ottawa à l'époque où elle était là. Euh, c'est sûrement un gain pour Policy Options qu'elle soit plus là, mais c'est une perte pour le journalisme canadien. Moi, j'aimais beaucoup ce que... OK, parfait. Non, ouais, j'aimais beaucoup ce que Jennifer faisait parce que c'était toujours factuel. Euh, on parlait de qualité de journaliste. Jennifer était, faisait partie de, cette, de, ce, de ce journalisme de qualité. Euh, on a, les, on a les, les, ces, ces défis-là dont on parle Jennifer sont très, très présents. Euh, moi, j'ai eu la chance d'aller euh, en Alberta une semaine en février pour un texte que je prépare pour le magazine. Puis ça a coûté, euh, ben, dans les standards actuels, assez cher. Hein. Tu as le billet d'avion, puis tu as l'hôtel, puis les restaurants, etc. Puis là, c'est parce qu'on est en année électorale. Puis je prépare un truc sur la, la tension dans la fédération avec l'aliénation de l'Ouest qui est de retour. Puis mon boss a dit, bon, ben OK, ça vaut la peine. Euh, mais mon autre collègue qui, lui, voulait aller faire un reportage à Terre-Neuve, parce que Terre-Neuve est en faillite, puis à peu près personne au Canada le sait, mais c'est une province qui va extrêmement mal. Euh, puis il n'ira pas à Terre-Neuve, parce qu'on n'a pas le budget pour faire les deux. Euh, il y a quelques années, on a renvoyé un journaliste à Terre-Neuve aussi. Mais le mandat principal de l'actualité, c'est d'abord de parler des débats qui agitent le Québec, c'est normal, en français, dans notre nation à nous, puis ensuite, bien, parler de ce qui se passe dans le monde puis au Canada. Mais plus tu te rassembles sur tes activités principales parce que tu n'as pas d'argent pour couvrir le reste, ben tu as moins de papier sur les États-Unis dans l'actualité, tu as moins de papier sur Terre-Neuve, puis tu en as un peu moins sur l'ouest du pays. Puis mais ça fait en sorte que... Tu n'as pas des journalistes donc québécois ou canadiens avec des yeux de ce que les publics canadiens ou québécois s'attendent, que tu leur expliques euh, de ce qui se passe ailleurs dans la, sur le, au pays ou de ce qui se passe ailleurs dans le monde. Puis ça, c'est une perte parce que l'AFP va te faire un texte hyper factuel sur euh, qu ce qui se passe en, euh, dans un pays africain, mais ce n'est pas comme envoyer un journaliste là-bas qui passe du temps et qui dit ah, « je pense que pour les Canadiens et les Québécois, ce qu'il faut qu'on comprenne, c'est ça. Oui. » euh, Et ça, c'est une perte pour l'information de qualité ici. Là. Puis, euh, c'est un problème particulier pour des, euh, des communautés francophones minoritaires dans le reste du pays en plus, qui sûr. se plaint continuellement, du, on, souvent en traite Radio-Canada, de Radio-Montréal. Ouais. Euh, les, euh, les clips à la télévision sur euh, des accidents de voitures sur le, sur le pont Champlain, tu sais, c'est euh, des gens de Moncton, ils n'aiment pas ça. Il euh, euh, y a une frustration majeure dans, euh, euh, chez le million de francophones qui se trouvent euh, dans le reste du Canada euh, face à la couverture très québécoise euh, du, du Radio-Canada et de tout le monde en parle. Puis euh, Denise Bombardier a quasiment <rire> individuellement provoqué une révolte euh, euh, chez des, euh, des francophones à l'extérieur du Québec. Donc, euh, Mais ce que tu dis, on peut l'appliquer plus près d'ici. Je veux dire, même envoyer un journaliste faire un reportage maintenant d'une semaine au Saguenay ou à Rimouski ou en Gaspésie, ça coûte de l'argent avec l'hôtel, ouais. les déplacements. Puis les médias le font presque plus. Puis on se dit, bon, on pourrait aller vers les pigistes, mettons, les journalistes qui sont déjà sur place. Mais non, parce qu'on a comme tellement de moins donné de contrats dans les dernières années que le réseau de pigistes s'est atrophié. Ils sont allés travailler en relation publique dans des entreprises, dans des organismes, ce qui fait que des bons pigistes, il n'y en a presque plus disponibles parce que l'écosystème n'est plus capable de les faire vivre. Fait que là, on se retrouve à un moment où tu n'as plus personne sur place puis tu n'as plus l'argent pour envoyer quelqu'un. Fait que tu parles de grands débats nationaux, mais localement, à Rimouski, ils sont aussi frustrés que, 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 que dans l'Ontario francophone parce qu'on ne parle jamais de ce qui se passe chez eux. Oui. Puis c'est un problème. Graham, can I add one thing to, to in response to Jennifer that I think sure. is a little different than everyone else is talking about? And that's on the diversity question. I've been teaching at Carleton since 2001. And in that period of time, there's been a dramatic change in the makeup of our stu journalism student population. Um, so that now we, are, we have a, a significant Asian component of students who um, uh, maybe you know, in some of my classes, 25%, 30%. We don't have as many black students. We're starting to get more black students. We've got Muslim students. Um, we've got a variety of, of students that we never had before. So our journalism student population is much more diverse. We're working hard to get more indigenous students too. Um, that's tough to do, but, it's, but we're working at that too. Um, but 
the problem, I think, so, and, and large, that's significantly a result of the immigration to the country in the early 1990s, in that their, their children are now university age, and in some cases, it's the first generation of kids who their parents didn't go to university, and so we see lots of them. So our, 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 the composition of our student population is dramatically different than it was uh, a few years ago. But the challenge, though, is I'm seeing something on the other side that's more disturbing, which is, at Carleton at least, we graduate about 100 bachelor, 90 to 100 bachelor of journalism students a year and about 10, uh, 15 to 20 master's students. At the, at the bachelor's level, only about 25% of them have, have historically gone into journalism. Almost as many go into communications and PR. Some go to law school, some go to graduate programs, etc. Only anecdotally, but in staying in contact with my students these days as they graduate, and, and you usually hear from them when they've decided, well, they usually, you usually hear from them now when they've decided to give up on journalism and apply for something else and they want a letter of reference, but, um, <laughs> um, which, most the, which you're happy to do. But what, uh, what, I'm, what I'm seeing is fewer, there are jobs available for young people who want to go into journalism, not in the big cities, but that's the way the business has always been. Um, but those jobs uh, pay terribly. Um, there's little prospect of any advancement or increase in pay. Um, many of the higher level positions you might aspire to have disappeared because newsrooms are smaller at larger cities, uh, parliamentary bureaus smaller, most news organizations don't have any, um, uh, any foreign reporters, or very few anymore, so the possibility of going overseas is difficult. Um, so pay is rotten. Uh, paid out, and there's no prospect of it's getting better anytime soon. Uh, the lifestyle demands placed upon reporters these days are much more dramatic than when Graham and I were at the Globe and I filed at 5.30 in the day and my next deadline was 5.30 the next day. Um, so the demands, and, and I had a cell phone but it was the size of a car phone battery so I didn't take it around <laughs> with me very much. Um, now they're asked to do a million different things. They're asked to do them all day long. Um, uh, young people are, and this maybe get into a discussion of millennials, uh, they're increasingly not willing to make those compromises and, and as well newsrooms are not necessarily happy places to work these days. So the combination of all those things I think is leading more people who go into journalism, which some of whom are the more diverse population we want to get in there, to say after three or four years I can make a lot more money doing something else, forget this. And that's, that's a big problem for the industry that I don't think yeah. it's started to come to grips with yet. I would suggest that we have two more questions and that you ask your questions and then we will do a quick answer and that gives us gives a 10 minute break for uh, before the next session. Alain Noël, une question pour Alex Alex Castonguay euh, au Québec dans l'écosystème on parlait tantôt de la polarisation et Au Québec, on a parlé, quand on, on parle de la polarisation, souvent on pense aux réseaux sociaux, mais dans les médias mainstream, mm. euh, dans mon esprit, il y a comme deux sphères au Québec. Euh, il y a la sphère que je fréquente, qui est Radio-Canada, <rire> Le Devoir, la presse, l'actualité. Et il y a la sphère québécoise, ouais. qui euh, est la sphère que beaucoup de gens fréquentent, mais que personnellement, je ne connais à peu près pas. Euh, J'en vois des échos sur Twitter, il y a certains chroniqueurs que je, je lis. Mais euh, c'est vraiment deux univers. Et puis, on peut dire qu'il y a comme un mini-univers de radio publique, de radio privée à Québec, ouais. qui, est comme, euh, qui fait partie aussi du paysage. Euh, mais ce grand clivage-là entre euh, l'univers, disons, Radio-Canada et euh, la presse Le Devoir et l'univers québécois, c'est quand même assez important au, dans la, la, la vie publique au Québec. Moi, je sais que souvent, on me demande, je suis invité, on me demande qu'est-ce que pensent les Québécois, puis j'avertis les gens que je dis, <rire> je ne le sais pas vraiment parce que j'écoute Radio-Canada, je lis le devoir, je lis la presse, <rire> mais je ne suis pas sûr d'avoir toute l'information de, de ce point de vue-là. Euh, c'est vrai qu'il y a une différence dans le traitement de la nouvelle, dans le choix des euh, nouvelles qui sont euh, traitées aussi, dans le type de chroniqueurs qui sont dans euh, l'Empire québécois et ailleurs. Si effectivement... Euh, il euh, y a certains sujets où c'est très visible cet écart-là. C'est tout ce qui est, par exemple, l'immigration, laïcité, euh, où les chroniqueurs et euh, éditorialistes de la presse sont, euh, disons, à 90 d'un côté, puis ceux de Québécois sont à 90 de l'autre, ou presque. Il y, euh, y a certains sujets pour lesquels euh, 
je ne comprends pas pourquoi les 17 chroniqueurs et blogueurs du Journal de Montréal écrivent sur le même sujet. Ils sont tous d'accord les uns avec les autres. Donc, moi, ça. Je sais, c'est le fun, là. Mais je sais, c'est, euh, Richard Martineau est d'accord avec Joseph Facal, qui est d'accord avec les Ravaries, qui est d'accord avec Mathieu Boccoté. Je ne sais, pas, pas, sais pas trop la diversité que ça amène à l'intérieur du même média. Ça amène la diversité, certainement, si tu consommes donc ces différents médias-là. Mais. Tu as raison de dire que la, la majorité de la population ne prenne pas la peine de lire deux, trois quotidiens par jour puis de, de s'informer à deux, trois postes de radio différents. Là. Donc, euh, elle est là, cette, euh, cette, ce, ce clivage-là, puis c'est, c'est particulièrement vrai, euh, je pense, à l'extérieur de Montréal, là, quand je me promène en campagne électorale, là, puis je veux dire, LCN, ça rentre comme une tonne de briques là, en région, mais euh, RDI, ça doit faire ça doit faire du 4 pour 5 pour 1, là, LCN par rapport à RDI dans plusieurs endroits au Québec. Là, donc, euh, euh, je ne sais pas quoi te dire à part le fait que visiblement, eux, trouvent que c'est un bon créneau, que ça fonctionne, euh, Québécois. Puis j'imagine que de l'autre côté, on a l'impression que c'est aussi quelque chose qui fonctionne bien. Mais euh, sur certains sujets, pas sur tout, par exemple, mais sur certains sujets, euh, clairement, on ressemble à des journaux, mettons, plus européens. Où là, quand tu lis Le Figaro, tu sais ce que tu vas obtenir. Quand tu lis Libération, tu sais ce que tu vas obtenir. C'est comme dans la culture de... Je veux savoir ce que... Mon, mon, mon idéologique ad, mon, mon adversaire idéologique pense je vais aller lire le Figaro mettons c'était plus à gauche pour savoir ce qu'ils eux pensent en Amérique du Nord on est habitué de, à, d'essayer de tout avoir dans le même écosystème médiatique c'est moins vrai qu'avant c'est moins vrai qu'avant Alors, on a un peu plus de polarisation c'était vrai pendant la crise étudiante aussi je me souviens donc on a certains m- sujets là où clairement là, il y a une séparation médiatique entre les, les deux pôles dont tu parles là, qui est québécois d'un côté et grosso modo le reste de l'autre <rire> fait que, euh, mais je sais pas quoi te répondre à part le fait que je le constate moi aussi comme journaliste je sais j'ai pas de j'ai pas de pas de solution à ça je sais pas je sais même pas si c'est mal en fait peut-être que c'est correct puis qu'il faut juste comme que les gens s'habituent à avoir des points de vue différents euh, je sais pas It's not just a, 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 a Quebec thing, though. Like, I think if you look back to the U.S. election, um, the election of Donald Trump, why is it that, I mean, f- most of Canada, or Canadian punditry, and a lot of the um, uh, pollsters and the readers of the, Nas- of the uh, Washington Post and the New York Times were completely shocked that he won because because there was he a different too, com- huh, actually Be- yeah, there's that too. but there was a completely different conversation going on in in that whole sector of society than there was in those who were reading Breitbart or those who were um, uh, in more regional far flung areas who were reading their their regional media um, and so I think that there's a there's a risk of uh, elitism and having an, having a conversation unto yourself that's completely disparate from populist forces that may be Um, growing, um, and there's, there is, I mean, it's certainly healthy to have a debate, but if you're not sure what the other side is saying, then it's hard to have a, a fulsome and, and informed debate. Um, Peter McNally McGill, I, I'd like to just pose the question about the national post chain. Uh, it's in desperate financial state. Uh, it's effectively under American uh, financial control, yet it seems to have a stranglehold on uh, on virtually every major urban center in the country. Um, it seems to, and in, at least in English Canada, including the Montreal Gazette, um, each of the uh, the papers seems to have an identical section uh, that comes from the um, the Toronto edition of the National Post. Um, it has a very definite political point of view, that, but most of these National Post uh, individual papers have given up their local news, including the Montreal Gazette. It's very, very weak. But yet, if the chain goes, um, I think a major gap is going to appear across uh, uh, across the country. And I'm just wondering, uh, I, you, uh, on the one hand, you're trying to stay away from talking, I suppose, about individuals, but at the same time, you all represent individual publications and um, the impact upon the country of the National Post chain should it disappear which I think is not impossible uh, I, I wonder if you have thoughts on this um, I think it's I, I agree with you I think it's um, I think it's half Canadian hedge fund owned not just American hedge funds at the moment but still they're they're basically what they're doing is bleeding all the papers dry and as long yeah. as the papers continue to produce yeah. revenue they'll take them and when that stops they'll probably shut it down um, I I think if the Nash and and what you're talking about actually goes back to the era of convergence which is the can West global era which is basically said 
and, and both broadcasters and, and print, uh, what were print, did the same thing, which they decided that they wanted to make everything identical and make it all, um, you could cut down, I mean, the example I use is, is at one point Southern, which used to be the chain before it became Conrad Black owned it and then Post. Um, in, in, the, in, the, in the urge to cut costs in the early 2000s and largely to finance the debt that they'd accumulated in order to pay for the acquisition, said things like, why do we need 13 movie reviewers in 13 papers? Why can't we just have one person review movies for everybody? And that's the spirit that's gone through everything. As well as in attempts to consolidate on the broadcast side, um, all newscasts for Global or all newscasts for CBC or all newscasts for CTV all look the same. Um, so we're, we've essentially eliminated in, in cost cutting that's gone on not to the last few years but for the last 20 years um, and it's not just in, in news media, I mean you look at people like Heinz Craft and 3G and people like that and the things they're doing on cost cutting in, in the corporate world. Um, basically uh, they cut costs and in the process um, eliminated all local distinctiveness without realizing that it was the local distinctiveness that actually was the reason why people bought or watched the newscasts or television. Um, but I'm, co I'm confident that, um, I, I, I'm sure that if post media goes down, and before it goes down they may try to sell a few papers, I'm surprised they haven't tried to sell any, because I think the Toronto Star would probably try to buy some if they could. Uh, Windsor is a possibility, maybe London, um, extending the Toronto, the Star area. But um, if it goes down, I think other people will come in with other um, entities. But as I said before, I don't think it's going to be a general interest one that tries to appeal to everybody. It will be more focused because there's no business model for a general interest publication if it's not supported by advertising. And and and. But on the other hand, uh, as you describe the newspapers, I'm not sure how much of a loss it would be if they actually disappeared. On that rather gloomy note. Um, <laughs> I, I would like to thank all of the panelists for the contribution. We could go, go as, as journalists and former journalists, we could go on all day. But. <laughs>